Now, uh, I didn't introduce myself earlier. I did this last week, but some of you weren't here maybe last week. My name is Chad Self. I'm the pastor here at First Baptist Church Allen. This is the, it's been a month since I preached a sermon here. So uh, that's the, I've only done that once before. And so we're talking about sin today because I assume that me being gone for a month, there's no telling what kind of shenanigans you got yourselves into. So that's why we're going to focus on this. Now, this is, this is a part of a series because we're heading toward Easter. And Easter, uh, there's a road to Easter. And we're taking some deliberate steps on our way to celebrating Easter on April 16th. And these Sundays in between. Now, last week, Chris Jones kicked this off. If you have not listened to Chris's sermon from last Sunday, you really ought to listen to it. We can uh, watch the video uh, online. It's a, it's a powerful message on this Road to Easter theme, and uh, we're going to pick that up again today, and we're, we're doing that. I want to go really easy on you in finding uh, something in the Bible. If you have your Bible, you can use a pew Bible. You can use an electronic version of God's Word if you're using a phone or a pad or something. And Genesis is the first book in the Bible, so all you have to do is get just past the table of contents, and you're getting really close. And then Genesis, there's a, in Genesis, this is how Genesis works in the Bible. There's a chapter 1, and you'll never believe what happens next. There's a chapter 2. And then there's a chapter 3, and chapter 3 is where we're going to be this morning. And I encourage you to keep your Bible open, because we're going to work our way through this uh, just a verse or so at a time. I want to tell you something on this Road to Easter story. The whole Bible is, is it's, a, it's a history, but it's not just a history of... Uh, Facts and figures, and this happened, and that happened, and it's, it's a story about salvation history. The Bible is a story of God's redemptive plan for the world, of God, God coming into a broken world and bringing a solution, the only solution that works. That As you read, and we're going to pick this up clearly in Genesis chapter 3, we're going to learn in this chapter of redemptive history, why the world's in the mess that it's in, why we're in the mess that we often find ourselves in, the troubles that we experience, and we're going to also learn that God loves us enough to send a Savior and a Deliverer to set us free. So, we come to Genesis 3, and to give you some context from Genesis 1 and 2, what we find is that There's a couple, and their names are Adam and Eve, and they're living in a paradise called the Garden of Eden. And they they live in this wonderful, clean, clear, blessed fellowship with one another. And with their environment there, the animals and things that God has created, and a wonderful fellowship with God, their creator, in whose image they are made, and whose voice they love to hear and whose words they follow. God was first in their love. He was first in their thoughts. And then, after God created Adam and Eve in his own image, he placed them in this beautiful garden. He had, he had provided for every need of their lives. And they had, they had freedom, though, to choose and in that choosing, God established one, one stipulation, one rule. You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And, and that's when it all went bad. That's when things started going wrong. We have, in the beginning of chapter 3... And we spent some time with this a few weeks ago, and so I'm just going to retell some of this. There's the tempter. And the tempter approaches in the form of a servant. And it's one of those times in the Bible where we we, we say, well, where did he come from and what's his deal? And he just appears. There's no explanation. There's no introduction. He is just on the scene. And the Hebrew word translated as serpent, it comes from a a root word that, that means uh, hiss, whisper. And the, the serpent comes, and it says he's more cunning, he's more crafty, he's subtle, 
And he comes to Adam and Eve as a, as a subtle whisper. And he's a smooth talker. And he begins this discussion with Eve by, by questioning. He questions God's goodness and he questions God's love. And by the way, a lot of times people find themselves, we find ourselves in situations where this isn't going, life isn't going the way I think it should. This, this situation isn't going the way I think it should. I, I'm having these problems and this crisis. And you say, I think it's God's fault. I think, I think God's falling down the job. I'm, I'm doubting God's word. I'm doubting God's faithfulness. I'm doubting his person. Well, when you get to that spot, there's a reason you got to that spot. Because, because the tempter has whispered doubt into your mind, into your heart. Satan, the serpent, he didn't point out God's bountiful provisions he provided, he pointed to God's one prohibition. That when Eve mentioned the reason God gave the command, what we read just a moment ago in chapter 2, when, when, when the command is mentioned, he's, God doesn't know what he's talking about. You're, you will surely not die. God's, God's not telling you the truth. And he goes on to say, in fact, the reason God's told you you can't eat from this particular tree is because he's trying to keep you back, push you back, keep you, keep you away from being like him. He's, he's afraid of what you'll become if you'll be, you'll be like him. You'll be like God. And that's why God is keeping you from your full potential. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And here we see the very nature of sin. So the psalmist in Psalm chapter 8 verse 5 says that man is made a little lower than God. The image of God. But the thing about us is we have ambitions to be like God. Like God himself. And sin, the boys and girls, they talked about sin. They understand what sin is. Most of us understand what sin is. Sin is the determination that I want to go my way instead of God's way. I want to do what I want instead of what God, what God wants. I have my own agenda that in, uh, I want to be king of my life instead of him being king of my life. I want to be in charge instead of him being in charge. That's what sin is. It's dethroning God, enthroning ourselves. And the choice Adam and Eve made to disobey God started the entire human race down this downward spiral. The Bible says, when Adam sinned, this is from Romans 5, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yeah, I'm not, you're not responsible for Adam and Eve's sin today, I mean, any more than you're responsible for any sin that uh, Julius Caesar would, would have ever committed. But when it comes to what Adam and Eve did, I'm affected, you're affected on a daily basis by their behavior. When Adam and Eve sinned, they let loose the forces of evil on this world. And, and I, like they, have sinned. There's a story uh, from, it's somewhat disputed on the date, but 1908 appears to be our best uh, shot at this. The London Times sent out requests to a variety of uh, famous authors in England saying, uh, write an essay and for the London Times, and on this topic, what's wrong with the world? Well, G.K. Chesterton responded, the famous writer of the day, speaker of the day, he, he responded to this request, what is wrong with the world? And his was the shortest response. He just said, dear sirs, I am sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. And he's absolutely right. We've come a long way from the days when God made man to have dominion. Uh, think about this. We, we have subdued so much of this created world. We've come to understand it, come to control it, uh, come to, to guide this world. And now we take off into space to try to conquer other worlds. But there's one thing we've not been able to subdue, and that's ourselves. And 
God's given this capacity. This is from the Garden of Eden on. He created, take care of this, manage this garden. We have a capacity to control and govern, but the one thing we have been unable to do is to govern ourselves. What went wrong with the human race? Well, God endowed us with the power of choice because God decided when he created Adam and Eve, I'm not going to create a couple of robots who are always just going to do what I tell them to do when I tell them to do it. And in the ways I tell them to do it, I want them to choose. He chose to love us, not because we earned it or deserve it. That's what grace is. He chose and he, he wants us to choose him. He wants us to, to say yes to him. So he gave us a free will. And we know from Genesis 3 that as people, we deliberately choose to disobey God, to sin. And the result, when Adam and Eve sinned, the image of God is marred and defaced and man is alienated from the Lord, the Creator. There's a, there's a brokenness in the world. Don't you feel it? It doesn't take, it doesn't take you have to look very deep to say uh, the world's broken. Uh, I opened up my computer, this, turned on my computer this morning, got to the office, and I look at the headlines. And the headlines say a shooting with a lot of people dying. And it talks about uh, some terrorist acts in other parts of the world. And it talks about a famine. And it talks about a war. And it talks about evil. And we see it on a global scale. And we see it in, the per, in our personal day-to-day uh, -day living. With illness and the, the threat and the experience of death around us. And, and just hurt and broken. We're broken. Our world is broken. And that's what comes in the wake of sin in the world. And so this key word for us to understand the problems of the world and the problems in our lives is this word sin. And that's where we're going to focus in our efforts today. And I want to read now from Genesis chapter 3. And I'm, I'm going to pick this up in verse 6. So Satan's thrown out the temptation. Uh, he has told Eve, God doesn't know what he's talking about. Doubt him. Doubt his goodness. Doubt his care. Doubt his motives. Then verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was a delight for the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, and we, we've had whole sermons uh, over the years just on those steps of how temptation works. She took its fruit and she ate. And she also gave some to her husband. And it's important to note who was with her well, where was he in the moment of temptation? And he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. The Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman you, who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord said, God said to the woman, what is this you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. I was, I was doing some research. Uh, 2012, we, we took a, a group from our church to Israel and toured uh, the famous places and biblical sites. It was a fascinating journey. And we're actually, in 2018, we're working on putting together another group from our church to go and do that. If you're interested, send me an email. There's your commercial of the day right in the middle of the sermon. But as I was doing my research on this, I came across this story from a pastor who was leading a group from his church in Israel. And there's certain things you're going along. Uh, the, the pastor said that he came on this tree and he said, oh, by the way. You know, the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, there are multiple references to fig trees. Well, this is what a fig tree looks like in Israel. And he pointed to it. One of the ladies said, oh my. And she blushed. He said, are you okay? And she said, yeah, I, I just thought the leaves would be bigger. <laughs> now, 
And, and I recognize, I thought about this in the first hour when I told that, I recognize I will preach this whole sermon and there's a lot of heavy theology here. That's the only thing you're going to remember uh, when you walk out of here. Here's the thing, no matter how big those leaves were, they were never going to be big enough to cover their shame and cover the guilt of their sin. This was innocence lost, the loss of purity. And what it, what it means to me and what it means to you these thousands of years later is that Adam and Eve, the, the mother and father of the human race, chose to sin. And when they chose to sin, as the Bible tells it, they planted in us a seed uh, an inclination, a sin nature, an inclination, a leaning toward, toward sin. And we are born into that leaning and we all sin. And no one has to teach a child how to sin. No one has to teach me how to sin. It's just a part of our makeup. And when they sin, sin entered the human race. And the next question is, well, that stinks. You know, then what? Is there any hope for this overwhelming need? And well, Adam and Eve, they, they tried to fix it. They immediately became aware they'd, they'd lost something for sure. And that, that's how sin always works. Satan, when he's whispering, it's going to be awesome. You're going to love this. No consequences. No strings attached. Everything is going to be great. Oh, man, he's a great salesman. He's a terrible, terrible guy to lie to you. And, and we're enticed. And it sounds so good, but then when you sin, when you make that choice, when you step across that line, what seems so promising and seems so wonderful and seems so uh, beneficial, you, you feel the, the weight of it. You feel the burden of it. You feel the brokenness of it. And you know something changed and now something's missing. And, and for Adam and Eve, we start getting nakedness and lostness and incompleteness and something, something that was there is now gone and the glory has departed and relationship with God has changed and relationship with one another has changed. And, and sin still does that. And the Bible is so clear, and experience and observation provide plenty of evidence that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we all have that sense of loss, that something's missing, and we have this idea that there's, we gotta, there's got to be something better than this, there has to be some, something higher than this, and there's this restlessness in our nature, and we're in, on this continuous search to fill the gap of what is missing, something we don't have, and and people feel this incompleteness because we have this idea, and this is part of our dissatisfactions that come with life. We have this idea that we're meant for happiness, and we're meant for peace, and we're meant for joy, but somehow it's just been stolen from us. And so we have this restlessness, and relationships are difficult, and we can't believe, was I really born just to die? Is that the end of the story? Is that where the road goes? Is that as good as it gets? And we have within us this sense of destiny and glory and eternity. And, and so we grab at all kinds of things, try to recapture lost glory. Adam and Eve felt it. And they tried to deal with themselves like people do today. They, they sewed together some fig leaves. And that's how most of us deal with the sin part of life. It's how the world deals with it. Let's just find a temporary fix for an eternal problem. Let's just try to patch this up uh, on the surface level. Let's do something temporary for the eternal. Now, the writer of Ecclesiastes, and we believe it was Solomon, he tells about the search to fill this void, the sense of loss, this emptiness. And as he drifted into sin in his later years, he describes some of that journey and how I got to fill the gaps. I, I, I got I to gotta take care of how I feel. And, and so he, he just lists stuff from chapter 1 on. He thought, I'm just going to pour myself into learning and education and just knowing more stuff than anybody else knows. And that didn't do it. He tried wisdom, tried philosophy, he tried entertainment, he tried to medicate himself, drugs, he tried building projects. He used to accumulate property and he built stuff. Uh, he, he poured himself into just rolling around in his money and luxury and materialism and accumulating stuff. And, moral codes toward the end of the book it talks about he's I'm just going to find a whole lot of stuff good guy good guy good guy good guy good guy look at all these good things I did I must be okay and he found at the end of the road that everything was meaningless that all those things were just a a, a temporary distraction but we've been trying to do it the same way ever since the same process we 
We hide from the one true living God and we try everything else. We try to fix it ourselves and we end up trying to hide from God, trying to cover our own guilt, our own fear, our own shame. And the forbidden fruit, the sin, uh, we would discover it's not quite as great as it promised to be. It's, it's not, it doesn't feel as good after as we thought it would feel after. And we don't get away with it like the temptation tempter said, we carry this conviction and then the burden that comes with the conviction of sin and the reality sets in, for the wages of sin is death. This is what I've earned because of my sin is death. And man, if the road ended there, what a dark day it would be. But you know what the Bible says? The wage of sin is death, but God does not leave us there. The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's the good news of the gospel. And Jesus said, the Son of Man, He came to seek and save that which was lost. Sin brings lostness, and God comes to us in our lostness, in grace and love. I have some things for you, because I recognize how unfulfilled lives are if you don't get to fill in blanks on a Sunday morning. So, uh, here we go. This is what Peter did at Pentecost when he preached that sermon. He gave him an outline, he let him fill stuff in, and... 3,000 people were saved as a result of it. So you never know what's going to happen if you start filling in blanks, what God might do. Here's the first thing I'd want you to know. This is not a doctrine of sin. We sin first. We sin, and God comes searching for us. I'm drawing that from verse 8. One of my favorite hymns is uh, In the Garden. You know, like In the Garden? Any fans of In the Garden out there? He walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I'm his own. Like you're just strolling through with God. That's, that's Adam and Eve in the garden. They just, they just walking and talking with God in the Garden of Eden. What a blessed experience that was. They enjoyed this closest of fellowship with the garden. And sin came and just broke that all to pieces. And sin still breaks that relationship to pieces. The, the way things are worded in verse 8, it's not like... Uh, and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. It's not like, and God came down and there was a thunder roll and flashes of lightning. And God was already there. God was with them. God's close by. This was common. They were used to this. And they heard him coming. They'd heard him in the past. And in the past, they ran to him. But after sin, they hear him and they hide. Instead of running toward him, they run away. They hid themselves. And You ever hide from God? A lot of people do. Do you imagine it's possible then or now to do that? Probably not. Uh, here's what the Bible says about the nature of God. The psalmist said, I-, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. Uh, we know this. We know this. We, we know God's everywhere. God knows everything. And yet, like a, a prophet who knew so much about God and served God faithfully for a good while already named Jonah, when God said, I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to preach to those people. He hated those guys. Those are the terrible Assyrians. He wanted no part of it. And so instead of, instead of going to Nineveh, he jumped on a boat heading in the opposite direction. And the Bible says he did that in order to flee From the Lord. You ever flee from the Lord? Here's the key. In this story of them being ashamed, them hiding, them running from God. Here's the key. Not that Adam and Eve sinned. Here's the real key. And this is the part you got to hang on to. The key is God came looking for them. God didn't give up on them. God didn't turn his back on them. And he still does it that way. He... He cares about multitudes. You know, he, for God to love the world, well, he cares about the world. But he also cares about the one lost sheep. And he cares about the one precious lost coin. And he cares, all as Luke 15, he cares about the one prodigal son. And he cares about me. And he cares about you. And he comes and he initiates things. And he comes searching for us in our lostness. And that's what grace looks like. It's God reaching out to us, not because we earn it, not because we deserve it, but because of who he is. He comes looking for sinners. Here's the second thing. We hide from God in our sin. And and in that searching, He calls to us. Verses 9 and 11 give some examples. 
At the moment Adam and Eve needed God the most, they tried to hide from his presence. And I have seen plenty of people do this. It's one of those weird things that happens spiritually in our hearts. But when, when someone's marriage is struggling, when, when someone gets a diagnosis that they're, somebody they or somebody they love is really sick, when somebody's finances just get blown to pieces, when, when they are afraid, instead of running toward God, there's something weird in our sin nature that we run from God. We'll run from God, we'll run from God's word, we'll run from God's people. And, and folks just abandon all things God in the moment of crisis, in the moment of struggle, and in the moment of sin. Just when we need Him most. Now look at the questions God asks as He reaches out. Grace. He's not asking for information. Uh, he's, where are you? He's not saying, he's not hoping that Adam will respond, we're over here behind the fig tree. That's not what he's shooting for. He wants to know, where's your heart? Where are you in relationship to me just now? Where is, where has sin taken you? As a lost sheep, where have you drifted? Where have you wandered? Where do you find yourself in, in, in disobedience and rebellion just now? Adam, Eve, if this is your solution, how's that working for you? Is, is this what you hoped it would be? Is this where you want to finish the game? Instead, and I like how God does this, because God, God just tenderly draws Adam and Eve out of hiding. And He gently nudges them to come to their senses, because God is a God of grace. It, we, for a lot of people, they think of God as that God's waiting just to zap you with a lightning bolt anytime you mess up to, to punish you, to be just... No, God, God's reaching out to, to sinners all the time, just trying to get, get them back in. He pulls them in with gentleness and care. The Bible says, this is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So God's pulling them in, and, and he, gives, he gives Adam and Eve opportunity to confess their sin. And God's next question is, is another clarifying question for, for the couple. Did you do what I told you not to do? He's just teeing it, teeing it up for confession. Did you do the one thing I told you not to do? Have you ever said that to your children? Did you say it like that? Or did you, did you give them the parent version? Did you do what I told you not to do? <laughs> or you're, you're kind of like a machine gun. Did you do what I told you not to do? I don't think that's how God said it. I think God in His grace, He said, did, did you, and, you, and you feel kind of a passion. To, did, did you do what I told you not to do. When God seems far away. And some of you would describe your relationship to God that way. Maybe today. God seems far away. God seems distant. God seems way too silent. And you're, you're in a struggle in life and relationship. It, it may be a good time to start in investigating sin in your life. And, and maybe where that has led you. Did, have you done what God told you not to do? Have you disobeyed God? Have you ignored His word? Have you chosen sin? And, and now, now you're angry and you're frustrated and you, you feel the brokenness. And it's not because God's fallen down on His job or because God abandoned you. It's, it's really comes back to us. It's because of sin. And, and all those consequences, God always uses the consequences to draw us back graciously, lovingly to Himself. Third thing, we deal with symptoms, God deals with diseases. When confronted by God, we tend to deal with the symptoms because it's just how we feel. So we go with uh, felt needs, the, the, whatever's on the surface, like, um, I hurt, I'm afraid. And that's what Adam says, we were afraid. And so we, we covered our fear. We did something that would just deal with the fear. We didn't deal with the, the sin, we just dealt with the fear. And the fear would go away if they just stepped back into God's loving arms. All the, instead of running from Him, run toward Him, and the fear goes away because 
What does the Bible say? The Bible says there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. That's all they had to do. We deal with the surface level stuff, and God deals with the things at the core. If, uh, if I went to the emergency room, and I go in to say to the doctor, hey, I, I just have this terrible pain over here on my right side. Man, it's just... It, it just keeps getting worse and worse, and I'm just miserable. Can you give me some pain medication? The doctor could give, prescribe some kind of pain medication. I could walk out with some pain meds, and I could take, a, uh, take, take some of those, and as long as the prescription was there, it might help me to feel a little better. But when the prescription ran out, it's still hurting. I'd go back to the doctor again. I'd say, man, my right side is just not getting better. And he'd say, well, Chad... I mean, I could give you more pain meds. That's just going to mask the pain. See, the, the problem is you, you have this knife between these two ribs. And really, you're not going to get better until we take that out. Until we get to the root of the problem, it's going to keep getting worse. And your health's going to continue to decline. We need to get to the core issue. Adam was talking symptoms. I was afraid. And God seeks, seeks to help Adam uncover the sources. If Adam's going to find his wellness and his wholeness, he's going to have to deal with sin. And we can do a lot of things. We can, take, we can, take, we can medicate our pains in all kinds of ways. We can go to uh, counseling and we can do a lot of different things that are good things for a lot of needs. But some people, they're going to take a path. Well, maybe if, I, maybe if I try a whole lot of religious rule stuff. Maybe if I... Maybe if I take off this direction and I'm going to, uh, oh, maybe I'll, I'll find a way to medicate my pain. Maybe if uh, I just accumulate, like Sol Solomon, I accumulate a lot of stuff. I'm just going to work more hours. I'm going to find ways to distract myself from my sin, to just cover the surface level stuff. The Bible says this, as we, we struggle in all the wrong ways and destructive ways to try to medicate our sin. The Bible says this, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. He didn't come to make us feel better about our struggle with the works of the devil. He didn't come just to massage uh, the aches of our life. He came to fix it. He came to destroy sin, to destroy Satan's hold on us, to set us free. He came to deal with the disease. And that's, uh, that's the glory of the gospel. Fourth thing, we defend our actions when God desires confession. So in verse 12, Adam admits wrong, sort of. He doesn't accept blame. You see how he does that. Uh, he says, I have, I, I, I did what you told me not to do. But that's because of this woman you gave me. Wow, this woman. You ever throw that one at God? This woman? That's kind of a, we don't know how much time elapsed between the time uh, Adam and Eve are created and they're placed in the garden and this happened. Some people think, you know, maybe just a day or two. That this pretty rapid experience. They weren't in the garden for a long time wandering around before all this takes place. So that's a pretty far cry from the first. Do you remember what happens? The, I'll give you the, the little Hebrew translation when, uh, of this verse. When uh, God has Adam naming all the animals. And he's still, man, this isn't quite it. And then God takes from Adam a rib and fashions into a woman. The rib which he taken from the man and brought her to the man. And do you remember, remember what Adam said when he saw her the first time? That's, that's what it says in Hebrew. It's, he said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. She's awesome. Well, the reason I have all these problems, God, is this woman over here. Wow, that's the end of wedded bliss at their house, right? You know, Adam's going to live for maybe 900 more years. They got a lot of marriage to go yet. That's a bad way to start out. And they're going to patch up a lot of stuff, but truth be told, wedded bliss is going to be hard to come by for the next several hundred years that they're going to be walking the planet. 
But the blame didn't stop there because what does Eve say? Eve, she, first of all, she's really appreciating Adam. And then she says, the serpent, it's the serpent's fault. The serpent looks around and says, oh man, I got nothing. Now, we don't like to take responsibility, right? We don't like to take the blame. And examples are everywhere. And a person who, we blame our problems. Well, you, know, you know why I have my problems? It's because of my parents. That's why I'm having all these problems. That's why my life is the way it is. Well, it's, it's my husband's fault. It's my wife's fault. It's my ex's fault. It's my boyfriend's fault. It's my girlfriend's fault. It's my kid's fault. It's my, it's my boss's fault. It's my seventh grade math teacher, Mr. Grohl's fault. He just crushed my world to live. That, that's the reason I have all these problems is because of somebody else. And I'm going to point to all these other people. And we pass the blame right on down the line. And God, ultimately, because see, this is what Adam comes back to. Because he didn't just say, this woman. He said, this woman, by the way, God, you're the one who gave her to me. This is sort of really comes back to you. God, you're the one who fell down the job. And we do that too with God. Well, God, if... I mean, I know I've done some wrong things, but you know, if you'd made me smarter, taller, uh, faster, stronger, uh, healthier, uh, this is really on you. The Bible says we don't get away with passing the buck on this because it doesn't come from all these other places. We like to blame everybody else and everything else and all our circumstances. But here's where sin comes from. The Bible says each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire, it swells up from within a sinful heart that already exists. Then desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Well, that's a rotten place to end. And that's why the Bible doesn't end there. <laughs> the Bible says, if we'll confess our sins, instead of hiding our sins, running from our sin, justifying our sin, rationalizing our sin, if we confess our sins, he is faithful, and He is just, and He'll forgive our sins, and He'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He just wants us to bring it to Him. Not with excuses, not with a lot of rationalization. Just say, God, I've sinned. Fifth thing, we're separated from God by sin, but God's grace is greater than our sin. And that's a great... That, I've been waiting to get to the fifth thing for a long time, because uh, it's such good news. Sin carries consequences. Uh, Adam and Eve are learning new things all the time. But man, when sin entered the world, their vocabulary and what was in the dictionary of Eden, it comes to include these words that they had to learn. Pain, rule over, toil, desire, cursed, thorns, thistles, sweat. Where there was life, now there is death. Where there was pleasure, now there's pain. Where there's abundance, now there's hard labor. And where there was perf perfect harmony with God and with one another, sin has broken the world. Now there's alienation and conflict. And when, when Adam and Eve sinned, they came to be separated from God and fellowship was broken. The image of God marred. And, and Adam and Eve would die physically years later, but spiritually they died in that moment. And they're no longer innocent, and now they're sinners lost. And the Bible says they were driven from God's presence because a holy God can't condone sin. That's from the Garden of Eden. That's why a holy God can't tolerate sin in heaven. Their sins separated them from their God and their bodies and this is all the things that fill out the rest of chapter 3. The curses that come with sin. Their bodies come to know illness and pain and death. But here's the thing about God. God, God hates sin. But He still loves sinners. That's just a part of His core nature. And even in the garden, before He pronounced... He's already, he's already talked to the serpent. Then He talks to the woman. Then He talks to Adam. But when he's talking to the serpent, before he's laid down the consequences of sin on Adam and on Eve, we get verse 15. And verse 15 is sometimes called the proto-gospel. It's the gospel before the gospel. 
And on this road to Easter, it's important that on the day sin entered the world, so did the story of Jesus. This is what it says. God said, I will put to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Again, he's not just a snake. This is Satan. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And that part is, is very important. It foreshadows that a redeemer is coming. A reconciler who can make it right again. That the, the seed of woman, that one would be born of woman from God. And though the, though the serpent would deliver a crippling blow to the one who would come, the one who would come would deliver a crushing blow to the serpent at the cross. And there's this scarlet thread of redemption that runs from Genesis to the end of time, and it runs through the cross of Calvary. By grace... God drove them out of the garden, lest they eat of the tree of life and live forever, lost in their sin. By grace, God named his wife Eve, which, which means life, or life giver. It's a hope-filled word. Death would not win the victory because of the grace of God. By grace, God covered the sinner's shame. And this part of the story in verse 20 and 21, temporary fix, uh, Leaves from a fig tree. But God takes animal skins. You know how you get to an animal skin? You have to kill an animal. And there's a sacrifice. There's a cost. It's a high cost that has to be paid for sin. And, and an animal had to die so that they could have a more permanent covering for their shame. And it's just a, one of those shadows again. One of those illustrations of a greater truth to come that is coming a day when without the shedding of blood there's no, there's no sacrifice for sin that the animal sacrifices that are going to follow through the Old Testament and on into the New Testament period they're, they're just still shadows but the day's coming when Jesus the sinless Son of God is going to die on a cross and shed His blood to be the perfect covering that will forever eternally cover sins of confessing sinners. The way to the garden was closed to Adam and Eve. Here's what it says. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, this is the last verse in the chapter, God placed the cherubim uh, these angelic beings and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. There's a barrier. There's a, there's a wall that's been created between sinners and a holy God. And it's an interesting thing. Uh, is you, this is why you need to read the whole Bible. If you start reading in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and they start talking about that tabernacle, that portable place of worship that you know Moses... Uh, works, works with the people to construct, and it's the place of worship until the temple's built. But in that tabernacle, it's a portable thing. There's a, there's a curtain, there's a wall, there's a veil between the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was in the tabernacle, between the most holy place and access to people. You know, the high priest could go in there once a year on the Day of Atonement. That was it. It was it, because you were shut off. But here's the thing that we learn reading those books that sometimes can be hard to read in their application for us today. On that curtain, there's embroidered an image, the cherubim, that these angelic beings, the angelic being that stood at the entrance to the Garden of Eden that said, there's a separation. The symbol of the cherubim shows up on the tabernacle curtain. There's a barrier. There's a separation because of our sin between us and God. And it was an ongoing reminder. When Solomon builds the temple in Jerusalem, he, uh, he creates this place. There's a holy place again, the Holy of Holies. High priest can go in there once a year on the Day of Atonement. But there's a, there's a veil. There's a curtain. 
It stands between sinful people and a holy God. And in the temple, in Solomon's temple, on that, on that veil, it's embroidered the symbol of the cherubim, these heavenly beings. And they stand as a reminder that goes all the way back to Genesis 3. After the exile, they rebuild the temple and they rebuild the holy place and they put a curtain in there and the cherubim are on the curtain again. And then Herod the Great, he, he starts a construction project to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem really back to its formal, former glory and it continues on well after Herod's dead and they complete that thing at long last. But in Jesus' time, it's getting pretty close to being completed and, and there's a there's a veil, and in Jesus' time, that veil was 30 feet high, 10 feet wide, and the cloth four inches thick. It was, to, it was to block everything. It was to block any light from coming in. That The holy place was separate. It was inaccessible to sinful people. And I'm telling you this story to point you toward the Easter sermon and the Easter story. Because when Jesus died on the cross, what happens? That veil, 30 feet high, 10 feet wide, 4 inches thick, with the symbol of the cherubim on it, it's not torn from the bottom to the top like a person could have done it, but from way up top, it's torn down to the bottom. Because when Jesus died on the cross, the way was opened for sinful people to come to God. The way was open to have forgiveness of sin and relationship to God and eternal life in heaven. Jesus made a way. And he's still making a way. The way is open to you today through Jesus Christ who died on the cross to pay for your sin and was raised from the dead to demonstrate what he did at the cross, fully paid the debt. And today I want to invite you to say yes to Jesus. We are lost in our sin. We can get on some kind of self-improvement plan. We can justify things. We can put band-aids on bullet holes uh, to try to mask our need. Jesus. Jesus gets to the heart of things. And God reaches out to us not because we deserve any reaching, but because of the nature of who He is in grace. He says, I want, I want, I want to fix this. And all you have to do is say yes.